Welcome back to The Rundown. A driving force of the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign against Iran resigned that role in early August amid a failure to mobilize the international community to reinstate nuclear-related sanctions on the Islamic Republic. But Brian Hook ended up staying on at the State Department to see through the White House's efforts to normalize relations between Israel and Arab and African nations and to coalesce, coalesce the Gulf around neutralizing its biggest threat, Iran. Our senior U.S. correspondent Mike Wagenheim spoke with Brian Hook about the new Middle East and how he hopes the next U.S. administration will handle it. Happy to be joined today by Brian Hook from Washington, D.C. We appreciate you making time for us. For a guy that resigned four months ago, you're still pretty uh, active here in the uh, waiting days of the administration, obviously racing to the finish line in trying to uh, accomplish as much as possible in the time remaining here. What is left on the Trump administration's checklist here in the Middle East region? Well, we have had a really remarkable four months um, since about August when we were able to announce the first normalization with UAE and Israel. We have since done Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco just last week. This is what we have described as the new Middle East that's emerging. And in many ways, normalization is becoming the new normal. This is a very good thing for the Middle East. It's good for Israel. It's good for so many uh, people who live in the Gulf. Uh, because what we're seeing in places like the Gulf, they're investing in their people. They're investing in their future. It's the opposite approach that's being taken across the Gulf in Iran, where the Iranian regime uh, certainly doesn't invest in its own people. We think that the Gulf... Uh, we stood with our friends in the Gulf, and we have countered Iran. And that has been a very successful recipe that has enabled this administration to do a lot of very big and historic things, and I've mentioned only four of them in the last four months. Yeah, the uh, Trump administration spent a lot of time tearing down the Obama foreign policy. The Biden administration will probably spend a lot of time trying to tear down the Trump foreign policy. But a lot of experts and analysts feel that uh, Biden will build upon the accomplishments in the Middle East. At the same time, though, going back to one, once what was in the Iranian nuclear deal. Now, a lot of the accomplishments uh, that the Trump administration has had in the Middle East has been as a result of a fear about what Iranians, uh, Iran's influence really is in the region. Is there some cognitive dissonance you feel in, in, in Biden's viewpoint toward Iran and, and the greater Middle East? Well, I think you framed the question in just the right way. My view is that if the Biden administration pursues a policy of accommodating Iran and alienating our partners in the region, there will be no more peace agreements that are made. One of the ways that we were able to bring together our Arab partners and Israel was to counter the common enemy of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And so I don't know if the next administration will uh, pursue a new deal. They've made noises about doing that. Um, but it's very important, I think, just as a general operating principle in the Gulf, is that you have to stand with your friends. You have to stand with your partners. You have to, and you really have to counter the threats, not only to the United States, but also to our partners in the region. And when you talk with, the, with a lot of our Arab partners and the Israelis, there is no daylight between them on what is the existential threat that they face, and it's Iran. And, it's, and we've done a, a, a historic job of putting maximum economic pressure on the regime. We've restored the military um, option as a deterrent, and it's been very successful. And so there's a great platform for further success in the Middle East. The maximum pressure campaign was meant to bring Iran back to the table. They have yet to come back to the table. Is there, is there any regret from that end that you couldn't bring the international community along and get Iran back to the negotiating table in the time allotted? Part of what we had hoped was to get a new deal. But understand that the maximum economic pressure campaign is, is an objective unto itself. It's not a means to an end. Uh, Iran is still the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. They fund their terrorism by selling oil and petrochemical and, uh, uh, and, and minerals and foreign direct investment. So when you do business with Iran, you never know if you're funding commerce or terrorism. And if we want to get serious, if the world wants to get serious 
about countering Iran's terrorism, you have to go after the money. And the Iran nuclear deal made the huge mistake of reopening Iran's economy and allowing them to fund their military budget and to fund all their proxies. I'm very proud of the fact that during the Trump administration, the Iranian, the, the Iranian regime became weaker and so did its proxies. And I very much hope that the maximum economic pressure campaign continues. Uh, it is, we have built up an enormous uh, leverage to get the kind of deal that will be necessary to have no enrichment. The right standard for the Iranian regime is no enrichment of nuclear material. And that ought to be the standard going in. Uh, in the meantime, the maximum economic pressure should not change. On that note, Qatar has been paying uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to Iran for flyover rights because of the blockade on it imposed by uh, Saudi Arabia, the Emiratis, Bahrain, and Egypt. Uh, the U.S. has been working feverishly over the last few weeks now to try to mend that rift. Uh, it looks like there'll be a summit among the uh, uh, GCC states coming up in early January. Where does that stand right now, and can that rift be mended in, in the time remaining? Just as a policy matter, the United States has very much believed that Gulf unity will be of greater service than disunity uh, to counter Iran and to bring greater economic integration in the region. Because of the Abraham Accords, we're seeing a lot of economic integration now uh, with Arab countries and Israel. Um, and, and obviously, this economic blockade uh, has been very economically challenging uh, for all, I think, the participants. And so we would like to see greater economic integration, uh, more of a focus on countering the threats uh, that all these countries face coming out of Iran. And so let's just be hopeful uh, in the coming weeks. Last question for you, Mr. Hook. Uh, the United States has been rushing to try to get these deals done in the time remaining. There was some pushback in Congress about the arms sales to the UAE. That's going to go through. There's been some pushback as well about the immunity uh, possibly being given to Sudan for 9-11 related claims and also pushback about U.S. Uh, recognition over Moroccan sovereignty in Western Sahara, possible complications down the line dealing with China and Russia in terms of a sovereignty of disputed territory. Is the United States, in your opinion, um, doing what it can to make sure that it's dotting all its I's and crossing all its T's when it comes to these last minute deals? Or, or is there a sense that, you know, it's now or never and we got to just kind of throw everything we have at it? Well, what we've tried to do is be fairly opportunistic about the, the sort of where the Middle East is heading. Um, you look at Mohammed bin Zayed in UAE last year, 2019, they had the year of tolerance. They've normalized with Israel. You see the uh, King Mohammed VI in Morocco, who has had a distinguished history, his country have, of protecting the Jewish minority in Morocco. And so from UAE to Morocco and in between, I think you're seeing a shift towards greater tolerance um, and a real desire to put the conflicts of the past in the past. I think that so many of these conflicts, especially the Arab-Israeli conflict, has really been a drag on the futures of so many people. And I think most people in the Middle East who are under 30, uh, they don't want to be haunted by the ghosts of their fathers. They want a, they, they care about jobs. They're tired of sectarian violence. They're tired of the intolerance. They're tired of having their futures robbed uh, by extremism. And I think there's a moment that courageous leaders in the Middle East are seizing. And we are very proud to have been a part of that. Uh, there's so much positive, so many positive things happening in the Gulf and in Israel and in North Africa and in West Africa. Historians will remember these peace agreements as the beginning of the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Brian Hook, the uh, senior advisor for Middle East Peace, former special representative for Iran. We appreciate your time. Best of luck to you. The rest of the way, I know we got a long ways to go still. Thank you. Thanks for having me on your show.